Hello there, it's Jay here from Jay's Vintage Junk, and as I promised you, um, I said I'd try and do a little bit of an extra video on the, um, on this uh, for Christmas Day, and it's Christmas morning actually, um, and I've got everything I need to get done done, so um, I thought I'd do this. Um, I thought I'd do this video for you. Um, after I've uh, finished the last video, I have been playing about a bit more with um, the set and. Um, I managed to dig out my standards converter. Um, that's this little thing here. Now, the thing with these TVs are um, the signal that these televisions receive um, hasn't been broadcast since about 1984. Um, they're not only analog. These TVs. I mean, obviously, the analog um, broadcasts have finished in the UK. They finished um, quite a number of years ago. Um, but you, most TVs you can still use, you know, you can connect a video recorder or a games console or a um, satellite box or something like that straight up to the, uh, even older ones that have only got an RF input, they've no SCART or anything, you can use a modulator and you can get a signal on them. Um, these TVs, uh, like I said, they have um, a 405 line VHF um, signal and that hasn't been broadcast for many many years um, there was no video recorders or games consoles or anything that ever supported the 405 line standard um, so what we have to do is use a device called a standards converter to take a um, 625 line um, signal and convert it down to the original 405 lines that these TVs used and as well as that we also need to, uh, because there's no composite video, there's no skirt or anything like that on these sets um, you can actually, you can feed a 405 line baseband signal um, directly into the um, set, basically bypa bypass the um, RF section of the TV completely and just feed the signal into the video and the audio amplifiers and get a picture on it that way. You still need a 405 line source um, but that way you don't actually need to generate the frequencies that these TVs ran on and they didn't all run on the same um, television frequencies either. It depended on what part of the UK the set was from um, depended on what um, frequencies that these ran on. If this had been a um, London set it would have run on um, I think um, 45 megahertz um, for the vision and 41.5 megahertz for the um, sound this being a Birmingham set I think it's somewhere I'm not 100% sure actually uh, but I think it's somewhere around the 60 megahertz um, range um, for the vision and perhaps like 58 for the sound something around that um, that way um, and that these are AM modulated, not FM modulated signals as well. So, like I said, it's completely different from the later 625 line um, standards. This little box, however, this is what's known as the um, low cost Aurora um, standards converter. Uh, this can actually produce a um, 405 line signal at various different um, band frequencies that were used in the UK. Uh, this is selectable. Um, it will do some of the band 3 frequencies that we used on the later uh, four, 405 line TVs for like ITV and the um, commercial um, the commercial stations. But it will also um, do all the old um, BBC band 1 frequencies. And I've got this currently set to the um, old Birmingham um, frequencies. This is actually the this is the Aurora originally. Um, I, I don't know if it was the very late 90s or the very early 2000s the original Aurora came out. And it was quite an advanced piece of kit. It was designed for. It wasn't really designed for hobbyists. It was designed for museums and places like that. It was developed by a guy in America uh, from the early TV um, foundation in America. Uh, Daryl, I think he was called. It's a long, long time. I've owned this for many, many years. Anyway, he developed the original Aurora standards converter uh, for use, uh, like I said, in museums and things like that, so they could have old sets like this uh, actually working and displaying things. 
and it was like I say, it, it was an exp I think it was like five hundred pounds or something like that. It was not a, a cheap piece of kit, and he came up with this. Um, now these are digital standards converters. They're actually based on um, FPGA technology. Um, I think it's a Xilinx um, FPGA chip in there. And like I say, it does all the standards conversion digitally. Um, basically, what this is is a cut-down version of the original um, Aurora standards converter, as where the original Aurora could do multiple, multiple standards. You could, like I say, you put a standard 625 line um, signal into it. In fact, it could, you could, I think you could even use the um, American NTSC signal. I'm not 100% on that. I presume so actually to be in it was a US um, design um, and it could output I think it could output just about every single um, original TV standard that was, uh, was used in the world because um, all countries um, basically use different uh, line standards for their um, TVs um, I mean right down from our early, our early stuff, there was actually two competing um, line standards. There was a um, 405 line, and um, was it 200 and something line, uh, 300 and something line? It was one of the bad standards. Um, and then, you know, America had its own um, standard. Um, America, actually, I don't think they used... Um, is it 525 what they use um, at the moment? They didn't actually use that originally. They used, um, I think it was 411 lines or um, something like that. It was similar to our standard, but it wasn't exactly the same. And um, it, it was quickly dropped and they went to their, um, I think, is it 525 that um, America uses? I can't, it's 500 and something anyway. I think it's 525 or 515 or something like that. Um, they went to that standard. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm getting off topic here. So yeah, the original Aurora could do every standard. Uh, the low cost Aurora is fixed to one one standard. Like I said, this is fixed to the UK uh, 405 line frequency and the UK um, bands that um, the 405 line um, frequency your know, standard was used on. Um, I don't even know whether these are still available now. Um, when I bought this, and that would have been in, in probably the mid 2000s, I don't actually know the date on this. I can't see a date on it. I know this is one of the very early ones because to um, change the line frequency, the um, band on this one, um, the band frequency, you actually have to open the unit up and set it with dip switches inside. The later versions of these actually had a little. Um, selector on the side you put a screwdriver in and turn to actually change the um, frequency so this is, looks like this is the earliest iteration of the um, low cost Aurora um, I think when it, when I got it you could get them, like I said they were imported from the US, he only made them in small batches I think he made like you know possibly 50 at a time or something like that so I don't know how many of these there actually are out in the world there can't be probably more than a thousand. Possibly there is, but I, I very much doubt there's more than a thousand, two thousand of these ever been made. Um, but it was, a, a, generally speaking, cost you between 150 and 200 pounds when it um, came out. Like I, said, I don't know what you can get them for now. Um, there are many, many, many other standards converters out of there. There's ones that predate this, There's there was kit versions, there was commercial versions, various different prices, there's all kinds of different ways of creating the uh, 405 line standard. Um, I know of one person that did it using um, a specific graphics card and Linux and they got, um, because of the control you have over the graphics card using Linux, they could actually get their graphics card um, to output a 405 line signal and they did it that way. I've heard of people doing it using PIC microcontrollers because um, I've never really ventured into that myself um, because I, I did actually, I, originally when I first got into 405 line TVs I didn't have one of these. The way I um, used to get a picture on them I had two things. I had an old um, pattern generator, which was a piece of kit that, test, that 
TV engineers would have had, and it just um, allowed the TV to produce a cross-hatch pattern or a dot pattern. So it was okay for just making your scene of the TV actually work, but you couldn't exactly watch anything um, using that. Um, after that, um, what I did is I actually built a um, little um, modulator, a um, band one modulator. It was actually fixed to the original um, London frequency. And I used that in conjunction with a video recorder and um, a set of um, tapes, video tapes that had actually been recorded in um, 405 line that someone on um, a, a forum, this is um, going back you know, when there was lots of activity on forums, um, the Vintage Radio Forum actually produced some tapes for me using his standards converter. And that's how I um, used to put an image on my old TVs. I think I had like four tapes full of um, old period footage and old period um, films and stuff all on um, 405 line. And like I said, I used to um, use a video recorder and the RF modulator I'd built to produce the um, pictures. And then like I said, as I got more into it, I did shell out and I um, bought that. Now the wonderful thing about the um, low cost Aurora if you don't have a signal plugged into it, this actually um, outputs one of the old test patterns that used to be broadcast when a um, actual um, television program wasn't being broadcast. So during the day, because TV uh, was only broadcast so many hours um, during the day when it first started, and when it wasn't actually on air, um, they used to broadcast a test pattern for um, engineers to help help them set sets up. And um, like I said, if you don't have a video signal connected up to your Aurora, this actually produces um, a test pattern, um, which is what we're going to have a look at on here now. Now, what I've had to do, actually, um, I've had to make a little adapter to um, connect my Aurora up. Now, I've already had to make, that's an F basically, um, probably because this was made in the US, uh, your RF output is actually on an F-type um, connector. I've got a piece of cable, I think I got off an old Sky um, Skybox or something. And I just grafted on a standard aerial um, socket. Because actually most of the TVs that I have actually use, even though they're you know, vintage televisions, they actually do still use the standard UK um, aerial socket. Uh, this TV actually predates that socket. That socket hadn't, I don't think, had been um, put into widespread use um, when this TV came out. So it actually uses, I don't think it would have used coax for its aerial, it would have probably just used a balance feeder, like 50 ohm um, balance feeder cable. So you just have two, two posts on the back of the um, set for the aerial. So what I've done, I just made up a little adapter plug there. So that's the two posts to um, a standard aerial socket. So we can plug that into the back of the TV like that. And we can um, then connect the Aurora up like that. Now let's get this so you can actually see the um, screen because you don't see my ugly mug. You want to be um, looking at the. You want to be looking at the screen. Oops, there we go. And we're looking at the screen on the TV, and I need it so I can just get round safely to the back, just so I can do any fine adjustments that are necessary. But like I said, I still want you to be able to see the screen. We'll get the Aurora switched on. Oops, let's plug over here. So that's the Aurora on. You can see it's a little light flashing on it there. We'll put the um, power down to the TV set. Oh, make sure there's nothing, nothing under it or anything that we're safe. There's nothing around it. Power onto the TV. Switch on. And we'll just wait for the set to warm up. Now, obviously, like I said, this is an old TV set. It was going to take, um, especially from um, dead cold, it will take a little while for it to come up. 
just make sure we see. Yeah, I can see valve heaters just starting now. You had to be patient back in the day. Like I said, everything wasn't instant like it is um, nowadays. Hopefully we should start hearing a line whistle in a second. Can't hear a line whistle yet. There we go. You can hear the line whistle coming in now. You don't really get that on um, 625 line sets because the line frequency the, um, is too high for the um, human hear, ear to hear. But at 405 line, look at that. Hang on, let me just um, switch the, back, the background lighting out so hopefully you can see that a little better. Let's see. So it's not the brightest. Hopefully that will improve a little bit, but bear in mind, in fact, let me turn the, um, turn the other light out. There we go. Like I said, considering we've only changed that one resistor which burnt out in this set, all we've done is replace the leaky capacitors. That's all that's been done to this set is um, replace all the leaky capacitors in it. It's got all the original valves in it. It's got all the original resistors, just by that one resistor that um, burnt up. And I think that could have possibly been due to me um, moving things around a little bit while I was um, replacing those capacitors. I wonder if I'd actually rubbed it on that um, little bit of screening and that's how it had um, shorted out. I can't be sure about that, whether that or it just was its time to die. But, um, it, like I said, it's not perfect. This should be a perfect circle in the centre there. And obviously it's a little bit on the squash side. And that is the brightness absolute In fact, That was probably a little bit on the, that's probably a little bit washed out. That's probably a little bit more like it should be. But I'm quite pleased with that. Like I said, there's not been a single resistor changed in this um, set yet. And some of the controls are still very, very, very touchy on it. Some of the... Um, they're basically, they're a wire-wound resistor with a little slider on them. All the um, rear controls and... They really need taking out and probably rebuilding, but that's one hell of a job to do. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to do it when I can get what I perceive to be quite a presentable picture on that. You know, that picture is not bad at all. Um, what we still don't know is whether the audio section in this TV is working because the line out, the audio output transformer and the speaker are um, downstairs actually in the cabinet. So I think the best thing we're going to do, um, now we've got this image on it, is actually I'm going to stick this in the cabinet and um, let you have it, let it actually play. I'm going to get some um, footage hooked up. Um, Perhaps connect the DVD player or the Skybox or something up to the Aurora. And um, we can actually see this actually in its um, cabinet running. And um, we'll see what it actually looks like and sounds like. Um, like I say, I won't leave it here. We will do some more work on this set in the future and um, improve it as best we can. Um, it's a real shame about the ion burn there in the centre of the screen, but it's producing like I say, it's producing quite a reasonable um quite a reasonable picture there for a set that like has had so so much little work I know it's an absolute mare to change all those capacitors, but apart from that that's all really I've done to this set. I don't think this set was put away because it failed. I think this set was in use 
and they bought a new set and this just got put away into storage as a, oh well we'll keep it in case the set you know we need um, a second set or we need it as a spare and it just stayed there until um, it got sold off like I said I don't think there was actually a fault ever with this set you know and that's why it was retired um, I think all those capacitors have just died through old age um, it was probably you know it had an ion burn the screen was getting that little bit tired in it uh, wanted a new set that could receive the um, newer stations remember this has never had unless they used it with an external band 3 converter um, this hasn't been hacked about and had a band 3 converter so this this set I doubt it's ever um, been used to watch ITV. It was probably just used to watch. In fact, with it having the Birmingham, uh, being a Birmingham TRF set, I very, very much doubt it ever was used on um, the Band 3 on um, to watch um, any of the commercial stations. I think this was probably retired, you know, late 1950s. I mean that did happen to quite a lot of these earlier sets you know by like say 57 when um, ITV was um, getting well established and the other commercial um, stations people either converting their sets and um, making them so they could run um, and receive them stations or they were um, retiring their early sets and um, getting something newer that could receive the new um, stations so uh, what I'll do is I'll shut down here and um, when, we, when we get back we'll be in the living room and I'll have this thing hooked up. Uh, we might have to do a little bit of tweaking to, this, to the image just to get it to um, sit in the mask and everything on the TV. Uh, which we'll use this um, test card for because that's basically what it was designed for. And then we'll, um, we'll, we'll see if we can hook this thing up to um, a video source and we'll um, actually let it play. So um, we'll be back very, very shortly. Okay, we're back, and uh, as you can see, I've got the TV back together in the living room. I've given the um, implosion guard here a good clean on the inside because that was quite dirty. You saw the amount of filth that came off the CRT when we first cleaned it, and the inside of the implosion guard was quite dirty as well. Um, so that'll brighten the picture up uh, a little bit. I'll, I'll fire it, I've got it all connected up, um, we have got a little bit of a setback and some of the things that we've uh, found, now I've got it connected back up in the cabinet. So I have just been running this so it shouldn't take too long to come back on, um, come back up to life. Now I've got it in the um, cabinet and I connected the Aurora up to it because I wanted to set the picture up so it actually fully filled the screen. And I got it perfect. And then this happened. We'll see when we've got it powered up whether it does the same thing. You know if you can hear, but there's a line whistle uh, coming in now. And the picture. In fact, I'm just going to have to switch the main light off so you can probably see this properly. Because you don't need to see me, you'd much rather see the actual um, TV, wouldn't you? Right, in fact, let me get you down. Let me get you down a little bit so you can see that better. We'll get you down like that. We'll get you zoomed in. Right, there we go. Now, as you can see, we actually have got a reasonable picture on the um, TV and it filled the whole screen. And then after it had been on for a couple of minutes, it just came up like this. And it's actually done the same thing, just switching the TV right on now. So although it's as al almost as though we've got a 16 by 9 image on the screen. As you can see, the um, circle's no longer circular. Um, I did actually get that, so we had a perfect circle in the centre. Um, and then all of a sudden it just come up like that. I fiddled about a bit more with the TV and managed to get a stable image on it again. But we have lost probably about an inch of height there at the bottom. Now that could be down to... Um, it could be an issue with the scan coils. Uh, it could be um, a short in uh, the scan coils causing that. It could be uh, one of the um, valves uh, is a little bit tired and that's causing it. Uh, we could have a 
problem on the HT. Um, this set, obviously, we're not finished with this set. Um, it's definitely going to go back on the bench. Um, the other problem that we've um, got as well as that is um, with no audio. As in, well, we've got audio. If I turn the volume up, obviously it's a bit scratchy. But we've actually got audio there. But when I actually put a signal source through this thing, we're not getting any audio through. I'll quickly demonstrate that. So I've got the Aurora connected up, and what I'll do, I've got a DVD player um, connected up to it with something in that hopefully uh, won't get me anything. Well, it shouldn't get me anything on copyright anyway, because there's not going to be any audio. But um, we'll connect the um, we'll connect the Aurora up to the um, DVD player. We'll connect the audio up as well. There we go. And we'll start that playing. Oh, I've not got a disc in. You, know, you get prepared for these things and then. Uh, <laughs> oh, let's try this disc. I've got some, these are uh, from the um, British, oh you can't see that, but they're from the uh, British Vintage Wi uh, Wireless Society, these um, DVDs, because I used to be a, uh, a member, and every year you got a uh, free DVD with some old footage on it, you play that. Now we should have audio at this time. Like I said, the audio at, audio stage is definitely working. As you can hear, we've got a slight scratchy volume control. But we're not actually getting any audio coming through from the TV. So that's something else we're going to have to look at. It's probably something in the IF stage, not the IF stage, the um, RF stage on the audio side. Um, it could just be down to a bad valve. It could be something quite simple, but we'll, like I said, we'll look into that um, when we get back onto this TV. But as you can see, apart from the fact we've got the ion burning in the centre, and like I said, it's not filling the full screen at the moment, we'll have to um, have a look into that and find out why that's happening. But apart from that, we do actually have a watchable image on that screen. I mean, that. You know, that picture is watchable. So I am super, super pleased with progress so far. It's, it's a shame about the ion burn. But um, it's still usable. Like I said, that CRT is still um, usable. And the more I use it, that might just brighten up even a little bit further. Like I said, I'm going to have to do some more work, find out what has caused that issue. Because I did have the picture fully filling this screen. Um, unfortunately, because I wasn't recording, I was just trying to play about with it before I um, started recording again. But um, that's how what well, that's as it goes with these old sets. You know, this set is um, 71 years old. Uh, it's probably not ran since I'd say sometime in the late 1950s. Um, like I say it was probably put away when that ion burn got a little bit annoying and they wanted a set that could also receive uh, the commercial channels, the band 3 channels and it was probably retired then and um, with actual really minimum work we've managed to get it to a stage where um, it actually does display a um, it does display an image again. Like I said, it's a shame we can't get the sound working for today uh, but I'm not going to be working any more on this on uh, Christmas Day now um, I just really, really wanted to see if I could get get an image on it and um, get it to play again. Um, and like I said, I managed to do that at least for uh, <coughs> for today. I'll put the lights back on. Anyway, in fact, you can see now even with the lights on, um, that picture's not bad. Let me just zoom you out again, so you can see. Like I said, we've got the lights on again now. And we do have, even with um, the, the room properly illuminated, we actually have a usable, viewable screen. We have a, view, a viewable image there. I'm um, really quite pleased with that, actually. 
Anyway, I'm going to leave it there for now because it's getting up to um, Christmas dinner time and um, I'm getting hungry. So I um, hope you enjoyed that um, little foray into a, um, a vintage pie television. Like I said, we're not going to be finished with this just yet. We will come back to this set and um, address this here and get the audio side working on it because I want this set to actually be in usable, functionable um, condition. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thanks for watching and goodbye.